Thanks to all of you. Um, the title is, as Manuel said, you were written in their hearts, Augustine's epistolary turn to women. Um, I want to say really, really quickly that the, the translation, the English translation of Augustine's letters here are from Roland Teske, published by um, New City Press in 2001. Um, in this paper, I argue that Augustine's approach to one woman undergoes drastic change due to letters. This woman is Teresia of Nola, wife of the famed priest and poet Paulinus. This change is apparent in a shift of language between Augustine's first reply to Paulinus and Teresia, who initiate the correspondence, and his second reply. The change in Augustine occurs through his reading not of parchments, but of persons, specifically the couriers with whom Paulinus and Teresia entrust their second letter. While he addresses only Paulinus in his first reply to their letter, he addresses both Paulinus and Teresia in the second, and he speaks to both, almost throughout the second letter. My argument begins with a look at the language of Paulinus and Teresia's first letter to Olypius. If you've read the Confessions, you know him from the Garden, at Garden in Milan. Augustine's friend and fellow bishop. I then note the similarities in the letter to Olypius and the first letter to Augustine before I turn to Augustine's first and second replies. This makes clear the shift in language. This glimpse into a moment of growth in Augustine's regard for a woman is important, particularly when it is easy to dismiss Augustine as unambiguously sexist, and to assume that in the specific case, he was always really writing only to Paulinus. Thus it seems to me, um, is it th this it seems to me is an assumption Robin Lane Fox makes when in his Augustine, Conversions to Confessions, he writes that Paulinus' first letter to Augustine is indeed a remarkable text in the joint names of himself and Teresia, although as usual, she contributes nothing. I am not convinced that she, quote, contributes nothing, end quote. Lane Fox offers neither evidence nor argument for his statement. Did Augustine rather learn from the couriers that Teresia really is a co-author with her husband? The possibility suggests itself uh, the possibility, excuse me, the, the, the possibility suggests itself. Teresia's co-authorship remains questionable, but the alternation between first person singular and plural in the letters from Augustine suggests the possibility that Teresia is more than a cipher. Paulinus was born to a noble family in Bordeaux. Teresia was a noble woman of Spain. They married in 383. Their only child, a son named Celsus, died in infancy. After their child's death, Paulinus and Teresia chose to live in continence or celibacy together. They mutually agreed to abandon their social positions, possessions and lands, save a small part, uh, excuse me, a small plot near Nola, and to give to the poor. These noble persons gave up claims of nobility for the sake of Christ, their renunciation becoming known around the empire. Paulinus was ordained as a married priest and after Teresia's death, he became Bishop of Nola. Dying in 431, he is now known as Saint Paulinus of Nola. The correspondence, consisting in seven letters, begins in 394. After Teresia's death, we don't know the date of her death, the two men continue their correspondence until 416. While Teresia lives, Augustine addresses her constantly as well as Paulinus in his letters to them. except for his first one. Augustine's greeting in every, excuse me, the greeting of every single letter to Augustine from Paulinus includes Teresia's name as co-author so long as she lives. Paulinus and Teresia write first to Olypius, Augustine's close friend since youth, who was by now bishop of their hometown, Tagast, in Numidia, North Africa. Letter 24 has this greeting. To our rightly honorable and most blessed father Olypius, Paulinus and Teresia, sinners, send greetings. They write that they do not come to know, but rather to recognize again Olypius' love for us, nobis, not me. This love the two write to Olypius has flowed from him who predestined us for himself, and in him we were created before we were born according to Isaiah 45.11. This we and us refer very clearly to Paulinus and Teresia or to Paulinus, Teresia, and Olypius. In this letter's third section, there is a shift to I and me. I have procured as you commanded, Paulinus writes, 
that universal history by the venerable Eusebius, Eusebius of um, Caesarea, the, the compiler of the, church, the first church history. The language then alternates between I and we throughout the, the rest of letter 24. The alternation between first person singular and plural in the first letter from Paulinus and Terasia to Augustine is similar to the alternation in the letter to Olypius. The first to Augustine, which is letter 25, has a note of deeper intimacy than found in the letter to Olypius. Olypius had sent five of Augustine's books to Paulinus and Terasia. The spouses more than appreciated what they read and both feel that they now know Augustine to a degree through his books. The letter's greeting is as follows. Paulinus and Terasia, sinners, send greeting to Augustine, their Lord and venerable brother, with whom they are one in heart. They go on, the love of Christ, which urges us, or get us, and binds us together in the unity of faith, despite the distance between us, has itself banished any feeling of reticence, given us the confidence to write to you, and made you known then to my heart. Um, Vishiverus um, Maeus, actually. Uh, through your writings, which I have at present in five books, he is now, Paulinus is now writing for himself, then switches to the plural again, we receive these books with the help of our blessed and venerable Bishop Olypius. Yet Paulinus uses I and me through most of the rest of the letter until very near the end. Throughout, he writes of himself as new to the faith, a claim Terasia could not make. He's explaining how this, the, faith, the Christian faith is new to him. This is something Terasia could not say. She was a Christian from, from, she was, she was from a Christian family. As Augustine acknowledges in his first reply to Paulinus, she is the one who led Paulinus more deeply into faith and faith's practice. In section five, these words appear, I, Paulinus, hope that you will readily welcome in the depth of your heart the love of our lowly selves, humilitatis nostre, which I trust, confido, us, me, you have already received through Olypius. The mention of Olypius is important because Olypius is held up as an example for Augustine of, quote, loving us before knowing us. If Paulinus writes of us, meaning brothers with me, some ancient literature would do this. There's this, this sort of royal we. Um, this switch from I, me to we, us language makes little sense. He would have done this consistently. As with Olypius, they ask Augustine to bless by accepting it, this one loaf we sent you as proof of our oneness, quem unanimitatis indicio, of heart. Again, this we could be a household, it could refer to Paulinus himself, but I doubt this. I base my doubt, especially on the first two replies of Augustine to Paulinus and Terasia. In response to the couple's first letter from Paulinus and Terasia, Augustine replies, this is letter 27 in the, the collection of Augustine's letters, only to Paulinus. Augustine's greeting is, to Paulinus, my truly holy and venerable Lord, my brother worthy to be celebrated in Christ with the highest praise, Augustine send, Greek sends greetings in the Lord. Augustine is clearly excited and encouraged by one so obviously a brother in Christ and a seeker of truth. He does not write to Terasia in the same manner. He does not write to her at all. Instead, he writes about Terasia and intends to address her only through Paulinus, he writes, quote, in you who are one with her, we greet her with all the reverence due to your holiness, vestre sanctitati, his own holiness. Paulinus is your holiness. Paulinus is Trasia's measure here. Very importantly, however, Augustine writes that in Paulinus's letter, the readers see your wife not introducing her husband to a life of softness, but bringing strength back into the heart of her husband. Augustine further writes of Trasia that she is united to Paulinus with spiritual embraces, which are stronger to the degree they are more chaste, end quote. After these few words about Terasia, Augustine again addresses only Paulinus. This letter contains no use of the second person plural. Yet, in Augustine's second letter, letter 31 to Paulinus and Terasia, he writes to you in plural terms nearly throughout. The greeting includes to Paulinus and Terasia, it's not just Paulinus this time, his most beloved and most sincere lord and lady, Dominis, his brother and sister, Fratribus, this would be normal, the masculine term would stand for both, naming the Fratribus, both of them, Paulinus et Terasia. He writes that I wanted my letter by which I replied to you earlier, 
Vestris Literis, letter, to come into the hands of your charity as quickly as possible. He writes that he desires that this letter come so quickly, quote, in order that, though absent in one sense, I might quickly be able to be with you. This to be with you, ut aliquo pacto absent sito, po, um, I'm sorry, possum esse vobiscum, vobiscum. Here we have vestris and vobiscum, vestris referring to a plural your earlier letter and vobiscum, which of course um, is with attached to the plural second person you. Occasionally and momentarily, Augustine does switch to the singular you in letter 31, but overwhelmingly the you is plural in this letter. For instance, quote, I would like to know whether you, vos, endure this bodily absence more patiently and more easily than we do, end quote. He calls them um, brother and sister, um, recognizing both as delecti to God, beloved of God. Delecti here is the vocative masculine plural of delectus. Augustine ver further writes, God knows that we also long for your bodily presence in these land, vos istis teres etiam corporaliter adesse cupimus, the two of you, the presence of the two of you. Here again, vos is a plural you, Again, in letter 27, Augustine does not use the plural, but only the singular second person. At another point in letter 31, Augustine writes, for you both I the enemy with great caution and work with great devotion to be meek and humble of heart as disciples of Christ. In a brief section of, this, of letter 31, when he commends, he commends those he is sending to Paulius and Terassia, Augustine does write a sec to a second person singular this is also the case when he asks Paulinus to send him the books Paulinus has written against the pagans. Um, above all, he uses the singular your as he typically does when he writes to your holiness or your charity. He addresses the widow Italica, letter 99, in similar but not identical terms with your goodness, um, it's 2a benignitatis, um, and the young woman Florentina with your reverence, reverentiae 2a. All considered, however, Augustine's use of the second pl person plural in his second reply to Paulinus and Terassia is very different from his use of the second person plural in his first reply. Between the first and second letter, he redirects his attention from one person to two. Augustine's discovery that Terassia is co-author of the letters might account for the change. But why the shift? Augustine writes very clearly to both Paulinus and Terassia. Not only does he write to both, he does so with an enthusiasm that shows was the reason simply that Paulinus continued to use his wife's name as well as his own? By itself, this would not have caused such a change in Augustine's vocabulary and tone toward Terassia, toward the inclusion of Terassia in a second reply and in subsequent letters. He addresses Terassia now as though she is co-author with Paulinus. What has changed? One intervenes between his first reply and his second. I argue, and Augustine's second reply bears me out that what has changed Augustine's approach toward Terassia was another letter. Augustine says he received another letter from the couple. Paulinus and Terassia had sent their second letter, letter 30, to Augustine in chosen hands, those of two trusted couriers, Romanus and Agalus. These two men are for Augustine, quote, like another letter of yours, aliam, epistolam vestram, end quote. A letter that hears my words, he says later, and replies, and is like the sweetest part of your presence. But he says that this letter makes a desire in us more avid to see you. We, we require you more. Sed qua vobis vicendis in hiaramus avidius. Here again we find vobis. The letter on paper and another letter in two persons sparks a longing in Augustine for the physical presence of both Paulinus and Terassia. The communication is not as satisfactory as a physical presence, but the two couriers really do communicate the physically absent Paulinus and Terassia to Augustine. Rafal Toshko writes that the metaphor of men as letters in this case is laboriously exploited. Further, Toshko claims, quote, these messengers are a perfect letter because they convey not only the sense of the correspondent's words, but represent their personae with more liveliness and vividness. In quote, the letter in Romanus and Agilus is, according to Tosco, a, a vehicle for, quote, emotions, a sign pointing at or even invoking the real presence of Paulinus and Terassia, 
or a lens through which one can zoom in on the inner chambers of close friends, end quote. Augustine does begin to address both man and woman after at first addressing only the man, and that change takes place only after the embodied representation of the spouses to the couriers. Might Augustine have addressed both Paulinus and Tarasia anyway? We cannot know that, but we do know that he does not address both until he receives the education in Paulinus and Tarasia given him by and through these two couriers. He asked the couple, quote, why or when or how could you offer or could we demand that you teach us about yourselves as much as we have learned from their lips, end quote. Through Romanus and Agalus, Augustine has a greater grasp of the man and woman who are now in some sense present to Augustine through the couriers. Not only as a kind of bodily presence communicated through letter, it is also communicated through messengers. Augustine goes on, there was also present something which could be present on no page, so great a joy in them as they told us of you, that from their very faces and eyes as they spoke, we read with an inexpressible joy, you yourselves. Vos, again, who are written in their hearts. He finds written in the faces and the hearts of these other persons, in the joy that's shown on their faces, he finds these two, these two persons. Um, this joy is shown on their faces from within since Paulinus and Tarasia have written themselves on Romanus and Agilus. The Antarasia of the last sentence is, um, is important. I apologize, I skipped a little bit for the sake of time. It is obvious that Romanus and Agilus very joyfully shared with Augustine not only about the man, Paulinus, but about the woman, Tarasia. Augustine writes further, quote, we read this letter of yours, namely the soul of the brothers, so that their soul appeared more blessed in our eyes to the extent that it had been more fully written by you, end quote. I submit that what the brothers revealed to Augustine about Tarasia, or what she revealed to him about herself through them, to something closer to Augustine's language, led something to address her, <laughs> led Augustine to address her along with Paulinus and to do so in joy. It is not clear that Augustine's gushing is as much for Tarasia as, as for Paulinus. As Catherine Coneybear argues, it, in cases where friendship is offered to women, the offer tends to be made on male terms. Still, the change is a major one in Augustine's approach. Indeed, he has two distinct approaches to one woman. One wonders if his later epistolary works, two women, benefited from this earlier change in approach. Would Augustine have given his treatise on unceasing prayer to Proba in his famous letter to her, letter 130, had Tarasi and Paulinus not written themselves on the heart of Romanus and Agilus? Would Augustine have been able to offer the young Florentina the warm, even motherly, terms of his encouraging letter to her in letter 266? Would he have been able to be firmly corrective of and caring and hopeful for the erring Ecdicia and her husband, letter 262, had Tarasia not been shown to him tr as standing truly beside Paulinus, even as co-author? There is also the letter to Juliana, known as On the Good of Widowhood, with its notes of the equality of the persons in various states of life, even if some of those states are higher than others. He addressed his deep anti-Pelagian work on the grace of Christ in original sin to Paulina, Pinion, and Melania. P Pinion is the husband of Melania, now known as Saint Melania the Younger. Would Augustine have written these rich theological treasures to women without the early change in his approach to Tarasia? We cannot know. Augustine's approach to Tarasia does change. He does correspond with a number of women, giving them great theological wealth. We do not know that his approach to, ter oh, we, excuse me, uh, we, we do know that his approach to Tarasia did change. We know that he wrote these marvelous letters to women. Tarasia is surely beside her husband rather than under or behind him, and Augustine comes to write accordingly. Does Tarasia make a positive difference for women with whom Augustine later corresponds? We do not know for sure, but it didn't hurt to have her as a predecessor. Thank you.